Welcome to Zion on this sixth Sunday after Pentecost. We hope you'll be blessed in your time and worship this day as we are blessed by your presence with us. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, we confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We pray. Almighty God, we thank you for planting in us the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us receive it with joy, live according to it, and grow in faith and hope and love through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Isaiah, the 55th chapter. As for the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not enter there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in all things for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace, and the mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, the eighth chapter. Paul writes... There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin, He condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, 
But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, also through his Spirit that dwells in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear now the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen. A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seed fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, The evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We pray. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word, and as we think on what we hear with our ears, open our hearts and minds to your living word to us this day. Amen. The way Matthew has Jesus share the parable of the sower, it seems redundant to preach on it. I mean, we heed Jesus' command and listen And then we hear the parable of the sower. Pretty cut and dried, right? Which is why you might be wondering, so what are you doing up there, Pastor? Jesus pitched it. We caught it. 
Let's move on. But did we catch it? Really? Who among us jumped straight into judgment mode and began classifying themselves and others into different soil types? Yep, good soil, good soil, hard path, thorns, lots of thorns, a bottomless pit of thorns over there, good soil. We delight in jumping into the judging seat and casting our eyes over others because it takes our attention off ourselves. Step off the judgmental bus and stop exercising judgment's cousin beating myself up mode. Beating yourself up isn't going to help. There's more going on here than sorting people into soil types. Instead of trying to put yourself into the text, which honestly is what we always try to do when a parable rolls around, and sometimes that is helpful, let's move to a point where we can look at the whole piece of cloth stitched together for us because there is something there to see. What's the focus of the first part of this parable? The sower sowing seed. What's the focus of the second part of this parable? Matching word hearers to soil types. We pretty much skip right over that first part, don't we? as we each rush to claim good soil status, to self-define our relationship with God, we bash right past the sower section that we've decided is all about us. Why do you think we do that? Why do we rush headlong into something figuring we're the center of its universe? It occurred to me that St. Paul shares words that address that question. There were some last week, that whole circular logic piece about doing the things we know we ought not to do, not doing the things we know we ought to do. This morning, he puts it more plainly. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Why do we rush headlong into something, figuring we're the center of its universe? Because we spend our time living according to the flesh, making ourselves the focus, putting ourselves at the center, because we're clinging to the oldest sin of them all. We want to be God, and we think we are which I think is why we bash past that first part of the parable. In our headlong rush to get what we think is all about us, and admittedly that's exactly how Matthew sets us up, we forget all about the sower who's out there sowing seed. Imagine that the sower in the parable is a City of Hickory employee equipped with a Scots grass seed spreader. Imagine that same employee wandering up and down Hickory streets, lawns, sidewalks, flower beds, vegetable patches, oily garage floors, vacant lots, parking lots, wandering everywhere with that spreader spreading bag after bag after bag after bag of seed everywhere. 
we'd think that employee had absolutely no idea what they were doing. No idea how to spread seed. Most would think that employee should be fired for wasting all that seed, wasting taxpayer money. Our thinking is human thinking. It's rooted in thoughts of scarcity, of there not being enough, of wasteful actions being oh so very, very bad. Obviously, something must be done about this wasteful City of Hickory employee. Something must be done. Something is done. Right there in that first part of the parable, because that part is all about God. God who sows the Word of God everywhere, all the time, spreading it around with not one blessed thought to where it falls. God keeps spreading it day after day after day, as well as spreading compassion and mercy and forgiveness and love and grace, spreading all of it around so it all tumbles and falls onto and into every plain and nook and cranny of the earth, every soft heart, every hard head. God pours out all that God is on everyone. Lavish? Yes. Wasteful? Is God's grace wasted on you? On me? Who made us judges of God's actions? Who are we to attempt to set limits on God's generosity? How do we know on what kind of soil God's hand is lavishly dropping seed? Oh, and let's be totally honest. Aren't we all the soil types we hear about? and possibly even all of them at the same time on occasion? We love, we hate. We embrace, we exclude, we oppress, we lift up. We're the definition of fickle. We change in the blink of an eye. One moment we declare we're Christians and in the very next moment we're railing against or stripping away laws and agencies and support structures that protect widows and orphans, the poor, the vulnerable, the marginalized, the powerless. Much of it is motivated by fear. Fear that there's not enough of anything. Not enough of anything to go around to everyone. That's why the peace and life and righteousness of which Paul writes all elude us. We keep a death grip on death-based ways of living. And that's so not where God lives. So not where God longs for us to live. The image I have of God in this parable is the old Cover the Earth logo of Sherwin-Williams paints. Know it? Paint is pouring from a can and it's enveloping the whole world. That's how God rolls. Whether you need or want what God's pouring, God's pouring it out anyhow. Your hard pathway, you're covered. Rocky ground, covered, thorny ground, covered, good soil, covered, all of the above, covered. Because this parable is about God. And while God finds us and loves us no matter where we are and how we are, God's love is so great it never leaves us as we are. God's love keeps pouring on us finding its way into our hard, rocky, thorny, and good nooks and crannies until, in God's time, we find ourselves living a life marked by peace and righteousness 
instead of fear and self-righteousness. So that's what I'm doing up here this morning. Jesus pitched it, and maybe now we've caught it. Forget the soil testing. Spread the seeds of God's word and God's grace. Don't stop spreading. Go far, go wide. Lay it on thick. You're never going to run out of seed. Cover the earth. God bless you and keep you this week and always. Amen. We profess our faith, saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, we pray to God for our shared world. God, your word has been sown in many ways and places. We pray for missionaries in newly planted congregations around the world. Inspire us by their witness to the faith we share. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. The mountains and hills burst into song and the trees and field clap their hands in praise. We pray for the birds and animals who make their home in the trees and for lands stripped bare by deforestation. Empower us to sustainably use what you have given. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. We pray for our nation's leaders. Increase their desire for justice and equality. We pray for our enemies. Bridge the chasms that divide us and guide authorities to a deep and lasting peace. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Care for all who are in need, especially those named on our prayer list and those we name before you now, aloud on our lips or in the silence of our hearts. For those who are doubting, renew faith. For those who are worrying, provide release. For those who are struggling, ease burdens. For those in fear, give hope. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Revive your church in this place. Nourish and nurture the seeds you have planted that we might grow as disciples. Replace what has been depleted. Sustain our ministries and deepen relationships with the wider community. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Eternal God, we give thanks for all who have died, especially Mary Kay Hill. Comfort us in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O oh God, in those too deep for words, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always. Beloved, share the peace with those you can in any way that you can. We also give you thanks for continued support of Zion Lutheran Church through your offerings online, through the mail being dropped at the church. Thank you for continuing to pay attention to your giving, to giving back to God, to giving back to the world. We pray, God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours, and your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Water and word, wine and bread, life and the community of saints, these are signs of your abundant grace. Nourish us through these gifts, that we might proclaim your steadfast love in our communities and in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our strength and our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. You are indeed holy, almighty, and merciful God. You are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so loved the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering therefore his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again. We give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, and these your own gifts of bread and wine, so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving the forgiveness of sin, may be formed to live as your holy people, and be given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Receive the blessing. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. As you go forth into the world, know that Christ is with you. So proclaim the good news of God in Christ through your words and deeds, serve all people and strive for justice and peace in all the earth. We will. Thanks be to God. <laughs>